So now these are the advantages of a disc brake. So let us look at you know, the other thing. We have already looked at the limitation, right? What is the limitation? Now we need to get the same brake force, we need to provide higher actuation force, right? So that is a limitation, but that is something is a trade off, we need to be ready to pay. Next question arises is what we uh, uh, <coughs> discussed at the beginning, right? In most passenger cars, right? We have disc brakes are used in the front and drum brakes are used in the rear. The question is why? Correct. So, this is the most common configuration we see disc brakes in the front and drum brakes in the rear, right, in most passenger cars. So, the question <coughs> becomes why. So, the answer is also like something which we have already seen, right. So, we are we are going to do a more quantitative evaluation when we do braking analysis, okay, that is going to come up, but just uh, as a thought experiment, right. So, we will uh, essentially answer this question by reasoning out ba uh, on the based on the analysis that we have done till now. So, if you look at a typical passenger car, you would see that the front wheels will have more load, static load than the rear wheels because in typical passenger cars, SUVs and all, you will have the engine, the powertrain, everything mounted closer to the front than the rear. So, you would see that even in a car is stationary, the static load on the front wheels are going to be more than the uh, static load on the loads on the rear wheels, point number 1. Second point is when we brake, that is going to be what is called as dynamic longitudinal load transfer from the rear to the front. We could we would have observed it for example, when we are travelling in a car and let us say the driver slams the brake, what happens to all of us? All of us tend to go forward, we will find out the physics behind it. Okay, we are going to come there, right? But as a result, there is going to be a what is called as a longitudinal dynamic load transfer. It's dynamic because it depends on the deceleration levels, which can change with time, right? From the rear to the front. So consequently, what's going to happen is that the net effect is that during braking in a typical passenger car, we are going to have more normal load on the front wheels compared to the rear wheels. So, more normal load on the front wheels means um, we will see that there is more capability of extracting more uh, braking output from the front than the rear. So, now this sounds counterintuitive, right? So, if I want more braking force from the front, would I not use a drum? Because we have seen that essentially the drum brake will give more brake force output for the same input, right? Why would I give a, uh, why would I use a disc brake on the front? The reason is exactly what we discuss, right? Mu sensitivity, the primary reason. So, let us once again consider a vehicle where we want 100 Newtons of total brake force. I am once again taking the a round number of 100, right? So, let us say you know, like there is a 70 30 split between the front and the rear. We will see how to come up with these numbers, okay, when we do what is called as brake force distribution analysis, right? So, let us say we want a 70 30 front rear split what it means is that out of that 100 i want 70 newtons from the front and 30 newtons from the rear right why do we then use a disc brake in the front i want a higher brake force but however i don't want that higher number to vary too much right because ultimately if you look at if we neglect all the other forces right even if you use f equals ma for a given mass the deceleration is going to be dependent on the brake force that we are going to develop, right? The decelerating force that we are going to develop through the brake system. So, that is going to be a sum of the brake force developed on the front wheel and that on the rear wheel. So, we have more brake force capability on the front. And with time, with usage of the vehicle, all right, with temperature increase, I do not want that 70 Newton to fall steeply, is not it? Although a drum brake would have given that 70 Newton for a smaller actuation force, 
the price I would have paid would have been maybe perhaps not acceptable, right? Because the break output will decrease steeply with decrease in mu. So, we go for the more reliable solution which is the disc brake on the front where we, we are having higher braking capacity. And then on the rear as a trade off between performance, cost, complexity, everything, right? We use a drum brake, okay? Because let us say we want to generate only 30 Newtons on the rear drum brake. Let us say even 30 Newtons drops by 20 percent, let us say to 24 Newtons. Numerically, I can live with 66 Newtons, right, of a decrease in brake force. But if the 70 Newtons drops by 20 percent, right, numerically that is going to correspond to a decrease of 14 Newtons, right. So, that may be a steep decrease, right. So, it is a, it's a trade off once again, right. So, this is one primary reason why we are going, uh, going for uh, a very common configuration of uh, disc brakes on the front and drum brakes on the rear in a typical passenger car. There is one more reason which is an, uh, this is the main reason, there is one more uh, secondary reason which we will figure out when we look at parking brakes and so on, right, as we go along, right. So, I hope uh, <coughs> it is clear from this discussion why, why we uh, you are we using this particular configuration. As I mentioned, we will do a quantitative analysis as we uh, go forward, right, okay. So, essentially uh, uh, this completes our discussion of uh, disc and uh, drum brakes, okay. So, now as the next topic what I am going to uh, start in this lecture is a discussion on hydraulic brakes, okay. Let us look at the hydraulic brake system. So, <coughs> so this to uh, write down a brief answer to this question, we will see that typically a more uh, normal load is available on the front wheels and we will discuss when we do uh, analysis and also a discussion on anti-lock brake systems that this would imply more uh, uh, potential for more potential uh, braking force right from the front right. This implies that need a reliable brake on the frame, okay. So, this leads to choosing this brake on the frame. All right. <coughs> okay, so that's the broad answer to that question. Now uh, let's uh, look at the uh, hydraulic uh, brake system. Let me uh, start the explanation with a simple uh, schematic. So let's uh, consider a, a simple uh, schematic which shows a layout of a hydraulic brake system in a typical passenger car, SUV and so on, right. So, hydraulic brake system as the uh, name indicates, it uses uh, what is called, what we call as a brake fluid and almost incompressible fluid, right, uh, for uh, uh, as a energy transmission medium, okay. So, the hydraulic brake um, uh, uses an almost incompressible brake fluid as the energy transmitting medium, okay. So, if we recall uh, the broad set of components of a typical brake, right, what were they? Source of energy, a mechanism for applying the brake a means of transmitting the energy and foundation brakes, right. So, from a big picture viewpoint. So, let us look at what happens in a typical uh, uh, passenger car. So, we can observe that 
you know like the the source of energy is the driver's pedal input right so driver's uh, pedal effort okay or input is the source of energy so then the foot pedal is the mechanism for applying the brake so that is the second one so now what happens in a hydraulic brake so let us say you know like the driver presses the brake pedal right so what is going to happen is that that brake pedal is going to be magnified due to a lever ratio and that is going to be transmitted to this rod which goes to what is called as a vacuum booster okay so what is this vacuum booster we look at each of these components uh, in detail the vacuum booster essentially augments the the driver input brake input force right so we will see how it works right shortly so when the uh, brake pedal is uh, pressed the force is transmitted to the vacuum booster and the vacuum booster augments or adds on to the uh, force which is uh, transmitted to it now the augmented force goes to what is called as a master cylinder so master cylinder is the component where uh, the mechanical force is converted uh, to a fluid pressure so the brake fluid which is there in the master cylinder is pressurized okay due to the force that comes uh, that acts on the uh, pistons in the master cylinder now uh, we discussed uh, previously that for uh, uh, ensuring uh, reliability you know like we have a dual circuit brake system so this is where the dual two circuits come in okay so the master cylinder has a primary circuit and a secondary circuit okay so p stands for uh, primary circuit <coughs> okay s stands for secondary circuit so there are two circuits in the master cylinder so that's why this is a uh, dual circuit okay mechanism so we have primary and secondary okay so this is where the split happens right because in a uh, in a typical passenger car hydraulic brake the uh, source of application is only one but the split happens in the master cylinder in a typical two wheeler for example the split is evident to us right because when we apply the right hand lever we break the front and when we apply the left hand lever in vehicles without a clutch right or explicit uh, clutch mechanism you know like we are breaking the rear right when we have a manual transmission a geared uh, motorcycle what happens is that we use a foot pedal right to break the rear so we can see that the split is explicit and decoupled right whereas in a hydraulic brake system uh, the split is inbuilt okay so this is where uh, the split happens right so we can see that there is a primary circuit and a secondary circuit so the primary circuit we are going to we look at each of these components in detail uh, the primary circuit uh, essentially provides brake fluid uh, these are what are called uh, combination valves we will uh, discuss them in more detail as we go along so there is something called as a combination valve the fluid from the primary circuit output comes to the respective combination valve and if we trace it we can see that the primary circuit is going to essentially actuate this front disc brake and this rear drum brake right so that is how it is arranged so primary circuit fluid is going to go to these two uh, brakes and the secondary circuit comes through its own combination wall and actuates this uh, 
disc brake and this drum brake okay so this is what is called as a this configuration which is quite popular in passenger cars is what is called as a diagonal split or an x split so you see that the split is like an x okay and it's diagonal right so diagonal or x split so we can also have a front rear split which is quite popular in uh, uh, heavy vehicles okay we, when we look at air brake systems you will see that we are going to have a uh, front rear splits that is the one circuit will provide fluid to the front and another to the rear right and uh, we can see that <coughs> the fluid goes to the uh, disc and the drum brakes and in the disc brakes we have already seen uh, earlier uh, in this lecture as to how that fluid pressure is converted to an actuation force in the drum brake used in a typical passenger car there is something called as a wheel cylinder you know like so which essentially uh, converts the fluid pressure into a, an actuation force right and then like transmits it to the brake shoes as we discussed in the uh, previous lecture okay so this is a broad uh, overview of uh, this uh, hydraulic brake system okay so let us start discussing uh, each one of these components in uh, greater detail so let us start with the uh, vacuum booster okay so <coughs> so if you look at the vacuum booster per se and if you look at a simple uh, schematic of that this is how it works Oops. so if we look at a, a, a typical uh, vacuum booster we can understand its operation from this uh, simple schematic so uh, as the name indicates right so it is going to use vacuum right for uh, augmenting the uh, uh, input force by the driver so what happens is the following so when the brake is not applied you know there is a diaphragm okay, in the uh, vacuum booster which essentially is subjected to uh, air at partial vacuum on both sides so you can see that both sides of this what to say diaphragm is subjected the cavity is essentially filled with air at partial vacuum <coughs> now the question is then like how do we get this vacuum in a vehicle so uh, uh, typically in a naturally aspirated petrol engine right uh, we discussed this when we looked at engines right so during the suction stroke the pressure in the inlet manifold is going to be lower than atmospheric so we will tap into that you know into the intake manifold in a naturally aspirated SA engine to get this vacuum but if we need additional vacuum we can always have a separate vacuum pump you know to generate depends on the design right so essentially one can always use a vacuum pump in turbocharged diesel engines powered vehicles there is no vacuum source in the engine per se right because the, at the inlet manifold itself like air is pumped in at higher pressures so we need a separate vacuum pump you know to enable this source of vacuum right so those are the choices that are available to us so now bef before the brake is applied both sides are subjected to vacuum now when the brake is applied what happens is that this rod moves and then let us say you know like we we look at this side as side 1 and this is this side as this half as half 2 okay now when the brake pedal is applied what happens is that previously both halves 1 and 2 were at the same pressure the movement of this rod will close the opening that attach a, that connects this ha first half to the source of vacuum then it will open a cavity through which atmospheric air 
will flow in right that is air from the atmosphere will start flowing in. So, obviously this is air at atmospheric pressure and that is going to be higher than the vacuum pressure is it not. So, once air at atmospheric pressure flows in with brake application what is going to happen? There is going to be pressure difference right. So, the pressure difference is going to be essentially P1 minus P2 at steady state times the effective area right of the diaphragm right that is going to be the net force from the vacuum booster is it not. So, this force augments whatever force is coming into the vacuum booster right and that augmented force is now transmitted to the master cylinder ok. So, this is the way in which the vacuum booster operates right ok. So, once again to summarize you know like before brake application the two sides uh, in the uh, two halves in the vacuum booster are uh, exposed or maintained at partial vacuum right when the brake pedal is pressed one side or the first half what we have labeled as half 1 is ex, uh, is filled with air at atmospheric pressure and the resulting pressure difference will provide a net force which will augment the input force from the driver right and this is going to be transmitted to the uh, master cylinder. So, we will look at uh, master cylinder and other components tomorrow and then like we will continue uh, with our discussion on hydraulic brake systems ok thank you.